welcome to The Threat Show, powered by Fletch. What I love about Fletch, and I know we're on The Threat Show, it is so much more valuable for people in cybersecurity to extract simplicity than the master complexity. Because that's the hardest thing for human beings to do. In fact, I think the industry transfers complexity from the vendor to the user. Welcome to The Threat Show. My name is Darren Kimlin, VP of Technology here at Fletch, and with me is Chris Wilder, Research Director at Tag Cyber. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, Darren, how are you? It's good to be back, as always. Great, likewise. So uh, this week, we're joined by a special guest, Alan Cohen. Alan has many years of experience working executive roles in both big tech enterprises and startups. Currently, he's a deep tech investor and partner at DCVC a venture capital company focused on implementing AI in parts of the economy that have yet to adopt this technology. Welcome aboard, Alan. Thanks, Chris and Darren. Great to see you guys. So we'll be talking with Alan more in depth shortly, but first let's run through this week's trending threats. I think the theme we're going for this week has to do with remote code executions in your devices, in your hands, in hardware, that's uh, middleware, in, in, in networking equipment, and even on cloud workloads. You know, we've talked about before, a lot of this is there's a lot of Groundhog Day going on here. And it's, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you get t- kind of tired of seeing the same actor groups and the same same companies and the same same methods getting exploited over and over and over again. So yeah, it's just in my experience, you know, a lot of times it's just stuff doesn't change. It just ha- keeps happening. Right. First on our list, basically it's it's Apple's version of Patch Tuesday, right? They've rolled out a number of patches across their entire ecosystem of phones, tablets, TV devices, and even workstations and laptops, right? But I think what's surprising is that they've actually rolled out patches for phones as old as 10 years ago, right? These were 10-year-old phones. And it's like, well, why would you do that? It turns out that a number of researchers at Google discovered nation-state threat groups and cyber criminals were actually compromising these old iPhones and triggering remote code execution vulnerabilities. Basically, that means if someone got sent a malicious link, the victim would click on it, and suddenly now they've got spyware loaded on their device. And it was so severe that Apple decided, we're going to roll out an emergency set of patches for this hardware. I mean, we haven't seen stuff as, as severe as this since Microsoft patched, what, Windows XP years after EOL. So yeah, this is pretty severe. And it's not easy to convince users to upgrade or patch these devices. I think with the most recent version of iOS, you've got that rapid security response that is baked into iOS 16 nowadays. But if you're on older hardware, it's still a manual process, right? Yeah. Ironically, this, this, uh, this patch was, or this was announced on data privacy day which I had no idea was a holiday, but it's kind of cool. But that's kind of the irony of it all. But yeah, again, you know, going back to seeing Apple in the news like this almost every single week is, is, is interesting. The thing that kind of struck me the most about this is that it's not going to get your younger daily users, Apple, Apple consumers, you know, they're not going to be affected by this. And it's going to be a lot of folks that, you know, like my father-in-law who has a phone that has iOS 12 you know, he doesn't know how to, it. he's scared to death of it. So that's, you know, I think that's where you're probably going to see this proliferate. I'm glad they got it. And happy data security day, their data privacy day. So, I mean, honestly, if you're still running that type of old <clears throat> iPhone, maybe it's time to just chuck the phone and get something newer, honestly, yeah. but it might be a better, better approach. Yeah. So next on our list is actually uh, vulnerabilities in networking hardware. Apparently, there's a new set of vulnerabilities with Fortinet SSL VPN concentrators. It's pretty bad, again, focused on remote code execution. An attacker can go in and just run any arbitrary code they want once they've compromised the the networking device, which is not bad. But it's gotten so prolific within essentially the federal government sector that Mandy's discovered that Chinese threat actors are now building custom malware specifically to load and run on these devices. Um, They're using the the common meme of bold move uh, to capture this. But 
you know, is this really a truly unique thing? Not really. They've actually been going after networking hardware for the past couple of months, if not years. We've seen vulnerabilities in Pulse Secure networking gear, Citrix, even SonicWall devices, uh, all with the intent purpose of loading malware on these devices. And it's like, well, why are they going after all this hardware? Well, it's difficult to patch. It's difficult to maintain. And in many cases, you can't load a piece of antivirus or EDR uh, security products on this equipment, right? It's all custom code, custom operating systems. And so because of that, it's, it presents a very unique vector. I don't know, Chris, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, we used to, we used to talk about how you know, if it's on hardware, it's, you know, nobody can touch it. And now all of a sudden, you know, over the last year or two, we've seen, we've seen more and more of these vulnerabilities pop up. And I think you're absolutely right. I think it's because there really are no vul- vulnerability scanning tools out there. Typically, hardware people don't even know how to spell cybersecurity or, or you know, know what it is. And there's when when something happens, the alarm bells don't go off. So I think you're going to see more and more of these, and uh, as these attacks become more more sophisticated. Yeah, I mean, they <laughs> this particular threat group went to the the extended effort of covering their tracks, like completely. You know, once it's once the malware is loaded, it completely disables all logging on the device. So you had no idea that it was compromised other than just assuming that if it's not patched, it's considered compromised. Pretty crazy stuff. So next on our list is actually a vulnerability that was patched by Microsoft back in September, but new details of it are just coming to light today. Specifically, IBM researchers found that there was a a vulnerability with Windows where if you had IPv6 enabled and the Windows system were either an IPsec client or server, an attacker could compromise the, the system just through remote code execution with this vulnerability. Again, it's pretty, pretty nasty. Most Windows devices don't use native IPsec usually, but if you do have it configured, you probably want to turn it off and use something different than the native version of of Windows or install the patch or disable IPv6 altogether. There's a whole bunch of different ways to approach this, but it's it's pretty bad. What are your thoughts on how you would approach this, Chris? I, I'd say, yeah, same remediation I would I would recommend, but I'm just flabbergasted by the sophistication of this one. We've kind of gone from, you know, attacking OSs and attacking systems to, I mean, now we're getting into the network layer. And this is, there's a whole other level of sophistication that these these folks have that I, 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 I'm kind of, I was reading through it earlier and thought, man, this is, this is really interesting. And I, you know, so the remediation is spot on. The more we do this show and more we, you know, look in this industry, the more scary it gets. <laughs> Even if you don't use this, if you're just uh, publishing software, right? Well, the next set of vulnerabilities are related to to Git, the most popular version control system out there on the planet currently, right? Basically, this particular set of vulnerabilities also triggers remote code execution. It's triggered when any developer decides to download maybe an untrusted or malicious software repo, right, from a public site like GitHub or GitLab. And if the repo contains this particular vulnerability, then their endpoint, their end workstation would be compromised. Or conversely, a malicious actor could submit and upload this laced version of their repo to a cloud service like GitHub or GitLab and potentially compromise the workloads in the cloud. So thankfully, the vulnerability was patched by Git, GitHub and GitLab uh, and a bunch of other cloud-hosted repos. But because the vulnerability is within the Git client libraries, you need to definitely make sure that your developers have the latest version of those clients installed and are not using uh, the outdated version. So it affects any business that authors and develops software using Git as their primary version control system. Again, it's you know very rare to see this level of sophistication, but thankfully it was d- discovered by a number of AppSec researchers rather than found to be exploited in the wild. 
Yeah. I'm not sure if that gives you any solace, Chris. Of course it does. I'll sleep well tonight. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, I, with this one in particular, it's, it's interesting because we've had four briefings this week from companies that are trying to solve dirty code, dirty containers, you know, all this stuff out in the wild that it's kind of a daunting task. So we've seen a lot of innovation, a lot of investment too, coming into this. And I'm sure Alan might want to talk about that a little bit in a little bit, but there's a lot of interest in this just because there's so much open source code out there and people are really leaning on it, especially larger enterprises and DevOps teams. And, and these continuous attacks like this, we're starting to see DevSecOps becoming more integrated into the DevOps and the CICD chain. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a webinar next week with Git Guardian to talk specifically not just about this this vulnerability, but kind of what are the challenges within in the marketplace and you know kind of how what developers are running into by you know seeing malicious code, secrets, all the all the bad things that are out there. Yeah, it makes sense. So this is kind of a wrap up of of threats for the week. If you want to dive deeper into this week's trending threats, be sure to check out the interactive Fletch newsletter and Trending Threats app to see all the stories we talked about and more. Now, on to our special guest interview. Alan, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So from your perspective, like what makes cybersecurity so hard for organizations? It's interesting, I think, coming with all the lines under my eyes and the graying of my hair in this industry that people, you know, like the IBM mainframe came out in 1965, the system 360, right? So mm. coming on 60 years, right? So on one hand, large parts of the technology industry, you know, fairly mature. They've been around a really long time. But on the other hand, we've had so many architectural shifts new computing formats and versions of code and innovations in applications and different ways that you users both build and consume applications, it's had an enormous amount of volatility. So if I'd say what a, how are cars built in the 1960s and where they are today, they both have a lot more electronics, but still the major components of the car is a powertrain, brakes, and steering, and they've had, you know, certainly a whole lot of automation and updating, and increasingly now cars as they become electric, you know, they have a whole different telematics package if you're looking at an iPad in front of a Tesla. You know, the technology industry, what happens is every time we have a wave of innovation, a lot of companies come in. I mean, when we went from centralized mainframe to client server, hundreds of companies came into the software stack and operating systems and networking, and then it consolidated down to, you know, probably two dozen major companies. Then as we move to more distributed computing with cloud and SaaS and eventually mobile, tens if not hundreds of thousands of companies kind of created and we're kind of consolidating down on that. So the maturity of the systems and the fragmentation of the control points and the players of that is pretty difficult to get your, your hands wrapped around. And so, you know, we we keep having these Cambrian moments, but the explosions get bigger. And so if cybersecurity is trying to kind of run off, at, you know, behind all of this, then all of the complexity, all of the distributed capabilities, I mean, even the way applications work today, they don't just run in one place, they run. I mean, if anybody doesn't know how an application runs, just look at your browser and look at all the little notations on the bottom as different APIs are being triggered to make things happen. And so it's a very dynamic and distributed environment. And that makes the challenges of cybersecurity, you know, you know, somewhat daunting. And, you know, as Chris was reflecting a moment ago on, well, what happens when the development environment is compromised, right? Which is like effectively saying, what happens when the bad guys break into the police station? <laughs> you know, that's, you know, and it's like, what the hell is going on there? And what I think we're finding is that there's fundamental changes. Actually, a company I love in that space is R2C. These are the <laughs> inventors of Semgrek, which is a super fast static analysis for an array of code bases. So as you're writing code, it does two things. It makes the code better and it makes it more secure. And interestingly, people tend to think those things are separate and they're not. 
more secure code and, and better code are actually the same thing. But that's a right. different paradigm from when somebody says, you know, I'd write this app and then some security person is going to take care of it later. Right. So the fundamental practices, it's not that far off to like your health, right? Well, if all you do is eat cheeseburgers, don't sleep, smoke cigarettes and drink. Like you don't need a PhD to figure out what the outcome is going to be at some point <laughs> in time, unless you have spectacular and unusual genetic composition. You know, computing is kind of a live organism. And we've allowed a lot of people to tinker with it. So it's, it's you know, it's just, it's just really hard because you're running after a whole bunch of different things. And I, I'll stop a second, but, you know, Mark Twain said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket carefully. You know, the truth is, if you're an IT manager or security manager, you know, you say, no, I'm running, a, I'm, you know, I'm running IT and security for an organization of 300 people. We have 71 SaaS applications People working from 92 distributed environments, you know, and using their computing devices as personal devices as well while they're working. So all of the entry points, all of the, you know, all the attack surface for bad guys is is, is a lot broader than it used to be. To your point, how do, you, how do you kind of see, do you see zero trust as a panacea or do you see it as something that's a good way to architect and deploy in, in the, the distributed work environment now? Well, you are you are talking to employee number five in Illumio, which is the I know <laughs> your leader in market trust and zero yeah, trust I know you are, yeah. networks. So you know, uh, caveat emptor, be careful of my answer to the uh, the listening group. Look, I think zero trust is an architecture like good health. Yeah, it is a it's a condition that I'm going to try to lower the vulnerability and blast radius um, mm-hmm. of potential breaches in my environment. And it's interesting, by the way, I mean, obviously John Kinderbag invented the term. He went over to Palo Alto and carried it in there, you know, into the firewall company. Uh, Other people have used it before, you know, some, maybe not exactly the same words, but now I've seen like backup and recovery companies calling themselves zero trust. It's like housing, you know, you know, there's zero trust for this and zero trust for that. But, you know, zero trust is basically no, no to yes as opposed to yes to no. I think it is a really smart architecture, you know, particularly at the networking layer. But you know what the other thing it does, and nobody's ever really thought about it, is like the internet was built, TCP IP was built to get a packet from point A to point B, not to discuss how to do it. So you can pretty much run around the internet from router to router to get somewhere. And I mean, obviously stuff happens at the speed, speed of light in many cases. But it doesn't mean you should be doing it, right? So I always say networking is about can. Can I get a packet from point A to point B? But security, and in this case, zero trust is should I right. yeah. this way? So what we're now starting to impose is kind of um, business rules about should people be doing things. Like, like there's no reason for the e-commerce web server to be talking to the HR database. <laughs> can try because the packet can get there, sneaky little packet running around in the yeah. back alleys of your PeopleSoft implementation, right, <laughs> from, from Oracle. But it, it never should have. So it, it's really effectively a blast radius. And I always, I think about zero trust architectures as, as kind of like, you know, next generation firewalls. And I always say, once if the next next generation firewall isn't a yeah. firewall at all? It's actually an architecture for communications. That's what I think is powerful about zero trust. It's like the reason you put people put their kids on a school bus rather than taking an Uber or walking to school is because it is a secure, perceived as secure, you know, passage for a young child and from their home, which is something that is secure, to their school, which hopefully is also something that is secure. As opposed to saying, I don't care how you get to school, just make sure you're there at 10 o'clock every day. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, because I advise both the enterprises and, and and our vendor clients is just do something. You know, if you gotta you may not have a very good strong security staff, you may or a security team at all. It's just some place where you can start. And no, I I, th- I think you're right, right? Is what did Hamlet say? <laughs> is it nobler to leave yourself open to the slings and arrows of outrageous form or yeah. outrageous fortune or take up arms. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like everything else that anything that reduces risk and you don't need a PhD to implement 
is yeah. probably a good thing to do, particularly things that don't break other things, which is always the biggest challenge, right? You know, I mean, another great example of that is kind of, you know, multi-factor authentication. Just checking you're not lying about your passport <laughs> into a computing environment isn't a bad thing. And it is why the TSA makes sure, one, you have a valid form of ID and you are who you are when they look at your license or your passport. They do two things, right? They say, that looks like Alan, you know, five foot eight, not really good looking, about the right age. And But the system also checks is whether it's a valid driver's license from the California DMV. It's a pretty good way. Those are trusted forms of identity, and it is and it is buying into that. So, you know, to the earlier conversation, also, I think that Chris brought up, the challenge now is a lot of the identity, and poor Okta has had their head smashed in, right, in the last couple of, you know, years. And now we're actually seeing a class of products, which is basically identity protection, Right. Um, Silver Ford out of Israel does this. The preempt product out of CrowdStrike does this. I particularly like Silver Ford. Personally, I think it does a better job. And not only because you, because what you're saying is that, you know, two-factor authentication is like, it's basically giving you the key to the hotel, but it doesn't say when you're going to check in and when you're going to check out. And is there really weird amount of uses of the key to the door? to the hotel, the hotel room. So these next generation of products are, are also, you know, probing and making sure there's no irregular patterns when you're effectively using a passport into an application or a computing environment. So they're just evolving with the threat environment. But the concept of authentication makes a heck of a lot of sense, just like checking your ID at a bar or the TSA to prove that you should be there. Yeah, it's, it's, we're kind of seeing kind of emerging of a lot of these different point solutions that are trying to leverage machine learning and AI to do a lot more predictive analysis, not both internally and externally. And so you're right, if you have your hotel key, if I know your plane comes in at three o'clock in the afternoon, you'll probably be here by five and, you know, all down the line. And I, I think you're spot on with that. I, but we're kind of moving more towards a platform, platform-based approach, especially for the big companies, small companies, it's still going to be a pain in the butt to to get well, you know, it, it's a challenge, right? You know, one of the reasons I think we're in this situation, I grew up, you know, in the Valley working at Cisco, yeah. which was the Walmart of the web, right? <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, anything that can be converted to the network platform, we were offering, right? So we, yeah. had, we had switching, we had firewalls, we had identity, we had performance management, right? And we said end to end. Because if it's all managed, to your point, from platform one to end, it would lower the barrier to do that. And the interesting thing is that Cisco owned 60, 80% share of every category it was in. So it was the alpha. Actually, to compete with it is you had to be best of breed. Yeah. Right. Cybersecurity has completely the opposite profile, where there are hundreds of categories and tens of thousands of vendors but there is no alpha that even owns five or 10% of the entire market. So think about cybersecurity, like in a Darwinian point of view, there's no alpha predator that actually dictates the rules of competition. There are a lot of companies saying, Hey, the industry is going to consolidate, but the challenge is, yeah, except none of you actually have the, you know, the muscle to enforce that. Right. And well, I mean, it's a structurally a very different industry and maybe it will change, but, uh, but alphas in an industry category, Apple, you know, IBM and Mac in PCs, iPhones and Androids in, in smartphones. And then when I was growing up, it was General Motors, Ford and, and Chrysler. The interplay of very large companies set rules, set patterns, set standards and reduce complexity. I just don't know how we get that genie back in the bottle. What I love about Fletch, and I know we're on the threat show, it is so much more valuable for people in cybersecurity to extract simplicity than the master complexity, because that's the hardest thing for human beings to do. In fact, I think the industry, and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble with some of my investments and many of my friends, the industry transfers complexity from the vendor to the user. And the worst example of that is vendor certifications. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. I mean, you have to have them, right? I mean, I get them. I have, I mean, I have right. some CNA sure. and I have, you know, some of those certifications myself. Right. What I'm saying is right. I have mastered the complexity 
of your system. So I'm valid to use that. But that is a transfer of OPEX as opposed to making products bone dry, simple to use. And I'll give you a great example of that from my own personal career. When we were building airspace, the reason the wireless land industry took off is not because the networking guys were geniuses. I like, you know, we used to say we were. It's because Intel put a chip on every laptop called Centrino and everybody had Wi-Fi. (laughs) <laughs> and like Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park, nature will find a way. If you put a Wi-Fi chip on a device, it's going to connect to something, but it might be the law firm across the street, you know, the coffee shop down the block, or it might be a, a honeypot waiting mm-hmm. to grab you. So initially, in you know, the enterprise in particular, were terrified of Wi-Fi. And the original use cases was to show users weren't using. And I used to go around doing demos of the airspace system, showing, they said, do anybody here using Wi-Fi? And they say, no. And I said, well, you see that Mary over in accounting? She's connected over there. (laughs) Alan over there in product management, he's got one under the desk. Yeah. We turned it into heat maps. We removed the complexity. They didn't know what signal to noise ratio was. When you mean 80 minus 85 dBm, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Right. I'm leading my firewall and you know, my bringing my network into the street. Heat maps to show where the signal was and all of those things. So I think also the cybersecurity industry has not done itself any favor by actually taking the utilization and understanding of tools down to human sized bytes and explaining them in English. And that's why, I mean, we're on the threat show. And I think, you know, Chris was doing a really good job just a couple of minutes ago was just saying, here are these four like plague, hunger, famine and fire, you know, across some really large vendor spaces and saying, well, this is what you need to do. And then this is how you take care of it, because that's actually what human beings really need. Right. It's it's interesting. I invited back on the show. Wait till the cards and letters (laughs) come in. but. So we do. You haven't you haven't gotten your soapbox yet. So <laughs> it's, it's, we send it to you normally. <laughs> so, yeah. That's fascinating, though, Darian. I'm sorry to interrupt you, brother. No, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, there's been a huge paradigm shift with everything moving to cloud, cloud architectures, cloud computing, cloud services, and you think that that would simplify things for most organizations, but in fact, it's just hiding the complexity behind more additional layers, right? And it's it makes it very difficult for organizations to prioritize what they should really focus on. And, you know, this concept of like the shared security model that I think like AWS was one of the first to kind of pioneer the terms for. But for most organizations and businesses, they haven't quite internalized it completely. They don't know where that line is of, okay, we, we should care about these things, but... For these other issues, it's really up to the vendor that we're working with to solve it. Well, and- yeah, it's very hard to think about it. You know, we have a great example from the last couple of years, and it's a little unfortunate. Look at the COVID pandemic we went through. Because sure. there wasn't a strong central, like a lot of people did not trust the government response. Right. And there was a lot of noise. People didn't know how to deal with it. Remember, we were washing our groceries with bleach. <laughs> But we didn't realize, actually, it's not transferable through touching things, right? Right. Yeah. But we didn't know. So that goes to my point about the organization of the industry. Right. If the 10 largest vendors in the cybersecurity industry could, like the, 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 you know, the New York and New Jersey mobs and the Soprano could get together around a dining table and figure out how to take 50% of the complexity and signal and actually create some real intelligence for users, it would be an enormous gift to reduce that. And it would probably also accelerate the adoption of cybersecurity technologies because you don't know if it works. Like, should I leave my mail in the garage two days before I open it? Like with literal right. people, human beings who are not epidemiologists, biologists, or certainly infectious disease experts, we're, we're forced to try to have a go to the internet and figure out how to answer those questions. That's not a lot different than I think what Fletch is running into in a lot of its, you know, its user base. Look, I got a day job, you know, I'm the IT manager for a hundred person manufacturing company. I've also got to be the cyber expert. I've got to be in purchasing and acquisition of equipment. It's, you know, it's a lot to put on top of people and we just make it too 
hard. You know, the pro- the problem is too damn hard. And it's it's questionable as to whether anything is getting easier or or not. I think time will tell, honestly. Well, I mean, on some level, a great example of a vendor that does a great job, that is Apple. I mean, yeah. if you think about the architecture, Apple started the architecture of the iPhone. They did update everything, right? They're not perfect. And, we, and I sure. think we highlighted it and you can reflect on it, you know, in the beginning of the show. But, you know, they started with a secure element, right? A trusted companionship. Mm-hmm. So everything they touch goes through the secure element. You're not, yeah. The other applications are not allowed to use it. It's the holy right. of holies. That's Fort Knox. That is that is Langley, right? You know, mm-hmm. and you don't really hear about things getting hijacked through the secure element. Pretty hard to do, right? So they started with a trusted computing architecture day one. They, of course, made it available sometimes almost exclusively to their own application set. And that's led to a lot less pain for Apple users. It doesn't stop smishing, right? I mean, that's just human mistakes. Click on this mm-hmm. link, $10 million, right? That's a different kind of problem. <laughs> <laughs> My father used to give me a lot of lectures about lack of common sense. So it's I, I get it, right? Like, if it looks good, it's probably not true, right? Yeah. You know, I think those are some of the great challenges. But I think if there are three things that are really hot on your radar screen that really matter, do them. There's this old adage about Mother Teresa when she was alive. One day, one of her aides runs in and says, Mother Teresa, there's a thousand starving people outside our mission, and we only have food to feed three people. What should we do? And she goes, feed the first three people online. And that goes to what Chris said, do something. Absolutely. Fabulous, fabulous advice. It's a, what what great insight, man. Hard to believe you're only 36 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the battle scars, you know. It's, oh, uh, I love that. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you both, gentlemen. Always fun to to get a chance to bounce these ideas off of other luminaries in the field. And I think with that, that wraps up our threat show for the week. Stay tuned for next week when we'll be covering more threats, more security issues, and trying to distill down and make sense of as much of this as we can. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into The Threat Show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and interact with us on Twitter at The Threat Show. Also, be sure to subscribe to Fletch's interactive newsletter and Trending Threats app to go deeper into the stories we discuss. Be sure to stay tuned to stay ahead of threats.